on Post. Proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards. Welcome to beautiful Tullinally Castle, County West Meath, amid hedges prickling with histories. First as a plantation house in the 1700s, and later as a castle, Tullinally has seen many pandemics, wars, famines, and everything in between. For our purposes this evening, though, it's also an evocative home to that simple wonder that's kept us company for centuries, books, and the Onpost Irish Book of the Year Award. Tonight, Tully Nally's homely and spectacular library is our host for the number one event in the Irish book calendar. There couldn't be a better place to unveil this year's winner. We're surrounded by the spines, bindings and mottled pages from the greatest books of all time. Shakespeare, the Brontes and Samuel Johnson are among the ghosts watching over us here. Two weeks ago, the 18 category winners of the Irish Book Awards collected their trophies. Now six of those have been nominated for the title of On Post Book of the Year. The final decision is reached via your votes and those of a jury. Our six nominees were meant to be here this evening, but caution dictates that we celebrate their books at a distance instead. Still, we'll bring you through each of the works, meet the authors virtually, and explore why their books have moved us and entertained us just when we needed it most. Now, the six books in contention are Dr. Maureen Gaffney's hopeful and helpful guide, Your One Wild and Precious Life, which is the RTE audience choice. The children's book for junior readers is A Hug for You by David King, which is just gorgeous. Popular fiction headliner is the hilarious Ashleen and the City by Emer McLeisett and Sarah Breen. In biography, Seamus O'Reilly's sad, true, but very funny, Did You Hear Mammy Died? The non-fiction contender is Fintan O'Toole's scorching personal history, We Don't Know Ourselves. And the novel is global sensation Sally Rooney's beautiful world, Where Are You? And in her Eason Novel of the Year winning book, Sally Rooney takes her fiction to darker, more grown up places with the tensions of climate anxiety and social inequality in the background. The characters still struggle to make true connections though, and the search for love continues. Sally explains. I love overhearing people's conversations, not in a creepy way, but just by chance. If I'm walking down the street and I hear people talking, I find that very interesting. But I also just love talking to people, just letting people sort of talk about themselves or their lives or their ideas and listening to the way that they express themselves. My feelings about the culture, my feelings about, you know, climate anxiety, for example, those are things that the characters are grappling with at the same time and maybe that's because I was, in a sense, using the characters to kind of um, struggle my way through those emotions as well. The book begins with these two characters meeting in this bar in a small town in the west of Ireland. They've met already on Tinder, on the internet, and uh, they arrange to meet in real life. A woman sat in a hotel bar, watching the door. Her appearance was neat and tidy white blouse, fair hair tucked behind her ears. She glanced at the screen of her phone, on which was displayed a messaging interface, and then looked back at the door again. It was late March, the bar was quiet, and outside the window to her right, the sun was beginning to set over the Atlantic. It was four minutes past seven, and then five, six minutes past. Briefly, and with no perceptible interest, she examined her fingernails. At eight minutes past seven, a man entered through the door. He was slight and dark-haired, with a narrow face. He looked around, scanning the faces of the other patrons, and then took out his phone and checked the screen. The woman at the window noticed him, but beyond watching him, made no additional effort to catch his attention. It's kind of a scene in which nothing happens. It's kind of a book in which nothing happens. But to me, um, those little moments of nothing or not quite something um, can be very important and can even be, you know, the most important moments in life. Are you Alice? That's me. Yeah, I'm uh, Felix. Sorry I'm late. That's all right. What do you have? A vodka tonic. The waitress asked how he was getting on. Good, yeah, yourself. He ordered a vodka tonic and a pint of lager. Rather than carrying the bottle of tonic back to the table, he emptied it into the glass with a quick and practiced movement of his wrist. 
The woman at the table tapped her fingers on a beer mat, waiting. I was very interested in dramatizing that kind of interaction where two people are not quite certain about each other and how can they learn to communicate together and what can they learn about each other. And so that's characteristic, I think, of the novel's approach, really, for the whole thing. Um, it's, it's full of um, kind of interactions between people who are trying to figure each other out. And Sally joins us. Sally, your books are global successes. Does winning a prize even matter to you at this stage? Well, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind. It's funny, I mean, I actually think I was very anxious about this book, um, both books that I'd published before. You know, they'd been received very warmly. And I think, certainly in my own mind, that kind of caused me to put a little bit of pressure on myself. So it actually means an enormous amount to me that, that people have enjoyed the book. And obviously, at the end of the day, that's what an award means. It means that, you know, there's a group of people who, who liked the book and thought that it was good. And that, that really does mean the world to me. Those micro Irish details you've put in the book, whether mentioning Claire Byrne or the housing crisis, how important is that sort of detail to you? I think, funnily enough, it is really important to me to get those kind of specific details, right? And I can become quite obsessive actually about details in my books. So like I remember I used to visit a website all the time to check for like sunrise and sunset times on specific dates because like I really want <laughs> everything to be sort of exactly correct when it applies to the real world. And of course, that's the same for details about Irish culture or like the geography of Dublin, you know, wanting everything to be exactly correct. Now we hear that your first book, Conversations with Friends, is coming to the telly. Any idea when that will be? Well, I'm actually not uh, so involved with the TV adaptation of Conversations with Friends as I was with normal people. So I'm not actually sure of many of the details. I believe that it is going to be on air sometime next year, maybe next spring. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think for me, it's kind of exciting that I get to watch it as just a big fan. Um, you know, a huge fan of Lenny's and a big fan of the whole team. So I'm really, really looking forward to seeing it. Thanks for joining us, Sally. Now, the second book in tonight's lineup is a family story about grief featuring page after page of comic observation. The Dubre biography of the year is Did You Hear Mammy Died by Derryman Seamus O'Reilly, who was only five when his mother passed away. One of 11 children, his 90s childhood provided plenty of inspiration. I suppose I wanted to write this book because there are a lot of elements of my early life which are strange or larger than perhaps other people's, um, not least having 10 brothers and sisters and losing my mum so early. So, I mean, it is so different to be bereaved at five. You know, trying to understand how my father experienced it, especially since I've had a child. You know, and I sincerely believe that I am a low-level god every time that he goes to sleep and it's not, you know, he survived the night. I think humour is absolutely necessary to get through life, to particularly get through grief and death. Wakes are good because it's a demonstration of the love and affinity that people have for you. And the fact that people were so affected by my mum's death and, and probably by the specifics of the fact that, you know, she was leaving behind, you know, a doting husband and 11 children. It's a bittersweet memory, obviously. It's, it's obviously incredibly, incredibly sad. But also everyone brings food, so they would just, it would just slowly become this, like, you know, Viking banquet of <laughs> food. Please have an entire stew or you know, many, many sort of very dense fruitcakes that were delivered as well. The sheer mass of food on display may have given an outsider the impression that we were doubly afflicted. Not merely a giant family bereft of a loving mother, but one just pulled from six weeks under an avalanche in which they'd had little or no access to potato salads, gravy, or fruitcakes. I'm not sure if this was the origin of our family's long-standing collection of dark, dense fruit cakes, but I've always believed it to be the case. The notion that anyone enjoys Irish fruit cake, a foodstuff that boasts the consistency, shine, and taste of a wet boxing glove, is so fanciful I've long theorized that every gifting of a fruit cake is just that person offloading one day themselves were cruelly gifted some days or years earlier brown, thick and studded with dried fruits of dubious age and origin, fruit cakes are the nutritional equivalent of concussion. Despite our best efforts at redistribution, there were fruit cakes in our house that stayed for years. Some of them we dared not move for fear they'd become load-bearing. I would say I come from a family of storytellers and I think 
It's a very fertile ground for crafting and telling jokes and stories over years and also hearing other people's takes on things and finding out what makes a funny story. I think that's something um, I definitely learned from my siblings. You think you want to be a very cool adult and they remember you as a, as a six-year-old who walked around awake, you know, delighted, asking people if they heard that mummy died. And Seamus joins us. Seamus, the hero of your amazing book is probably Fermanagh's version of a dorky MacGyver. How is your dad? <laughs> um, he's very well. I'm sure he'll be delighted that you're asking. He rings me more than he used to. Um, it used to be just for uh, births, marriages and the deaths of faraway priests. And now he basically calls me to tell me that some other... Um, a person has, has, has rang him up to give him a, a thorough debriefing of all the, the lies and slanders and nice things that I've, I've put in the book. Yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting few months. And interesting how? I mean, your, your 10 siblings, as someone famously said, 10 are very much involved in this story. Um, how have they taken this story becoming so famous? Very well, actually. I mean, I think probably better than I could have expected. Uh, I don't know if I would have thought, oh, brilliant, someone else is telling, you know, the story of my childhood. But they've been really lovely. They've been uh, sharing it with a lot of their friends and, and, and just waiting for the other, the other shoe to drop, um, for someone to come out of the woodwork and uh, to, to really take me to task for everything that I've written. Don't worry, it'll be grand. Thanks a million, Seamus. For most, the skills of reading and writing come easily and in our early years, but it isn't everyone's experience. The Education and Training Boards and NALA run a network of classes nationwide for people whose path to reading hasn't been so smooth. Cavan man Michael Duffy is one of those people. I'm Michael Duffy. I'm from Kilishandra in County Cavan. When I was in primary school back in the 60s, I was one of those who slipped through the cracks. That little bit slower, I needed that little bit of encouragement. It was a very unpleasant experience. And when I left school, I couldn't read or write. I was involved in amateur dramatics. I used to help on backstage and things like that, you know. And I often thought I wanted to be up there among them. As they'd say the words, I'd be saying it in my head, like, I mean, I'd love to be doing that. I'd love to be dressed up like that. I'd love to be... But I couldn't. I remember distinctly a lady handed me a script. I looked at it, the words started moving in front of me. I was unable to read it, and it just meant mentally in my head, oh, I can't do this. A friend of mine gave me a laptop, and there was a computer class in a local town in Kilachandra, but during the course I discovered I had to prepare a written portfolio. And being unable to read or write, I said, look, I'm not, I'm not going to go with this. I'm going to stand back, let someone else do it. But there was a very good tutor there. She's copped that I had problems with reading and writing and she suggested that I should take a literacy course on a one-to-one -one basis. I'd done that for about six months and at that stage, she reckoned I was fit to progress on to a group setting. I wouldn't say reading and writing came to me very easily on the course. It took persistence and encouragement from other members in the group and the tutor. Being able to read opens up a whole new world. I always had a passion for cooking. I'd look at recipes and you'd read four or five of the ingredients, but there'd be four or five you weren't fit to read. Never McGuire sent me this recipe for chocolate brownies, and I'm going to try it out and see how it goes. He's a good chap man like myself. When I finished my course, I wanted to give something back to other people that had difficulties and be an ambassador to them because they look at me and say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Is it sitting up be the heart you're wishful to be that you rise up so and you will able to do it? Isn't it a hard case, Mike McInerney, myself and yourself to be left here in bed on the feast of St. Coleman and the rest of the ward attending mass? I like autobiographies. I like reading about people. When I read a book, I think when the author can do it, I say to myself, I can do it. Other people can do it. Everyone starts with a blank sheet. They have to build on it. And that's the way I look on it.
lovely example there of how reading can really change your life. Now, journalist, critic, public intellectual, in the course of his life from 1958 till today, Fintan O'Toole has witnessed some momentous changes in Ireland. In his Odgers Bernstein non-fiction book of the year, We Don't Know Ourselves, O'Toole draws on his own life experience to ask some important questions about the upheavals of the last 60 years, and it all begins with his childhood in Dublin's Crumlin. Funny how small the house is. You know? When you think that families were so big when these houses were built, I mean, the Irish Catholic family, you know, like ours, there was eight of us living in this small space. Crumlin was a, like a huge public project, you know, to, to really clear the slums, the notorious slums of, of inner city Dublin and move people out. Now, like, it's only three, four miles outside the inner city. But for people at the time, it really was as if they'd been moved to the North Pole. They were incredibly lively places. I mean, it was really, you know, I remember like growing up, there was just buckets of kids everywhere, you know. I chose the title, it really only fully works for Irish people, you know, because it's a, it's a kind of pun in Ireland, you know, where we say, we, oh, we don't know ourselves, you know, as most, you won't believe how fantastic everything is, you know, on the one side. And then of course, the other literal meaning of, we choose not to know so much about ourselves, which we've done over over the decades. The Catholic Church was absolutely dominant in every aspect of life. The change, I suppose, that's happened is that we started to look for morality, not from above, but from below. I, I think a big part of that happened with the Eamon Casey saga, you know, where a bishop had a child partly about the bishop, but a big part of it then was about Annie Murphy, the woman with whom he had this child. On the second day of its revelations, the Irish Times published a big photograph of her on its front page, and there was a sharp intake of collective breath. She looked like trouble. I think Irish people would have sort of expected her to be this sort of um, apologetic, you know, shame-faced figure. She thought that she was a great person, and quite rightly, and, and, and wasn't ashamed. There was a real effort, you know, on the Late Late Show with Gay Byrne to sort of accept that it was really all her fault in some way. <laughs> she just wasn't having any of it. He said to her, it was, it was a really terrible line, he said, well, if, if, if your son is half the man his father was, um, you know, he'll be, he'll be, he'll be a good, good man, you know. Um, and she just looked at him and she said, Oh, I'm not so bad myself okay. as you'd like Agreed. to think. The trouble was that although he was older and much more powerful, she was, in a sense, much more ambitious than he was. For she wanted the world to change, wanted a clerical potentate to come down off his throne and take charge of her messy life. The great heroes in my book, for me, are the people who broke the silences. And people not being ashamed, I think, uh, is itself a revolutionary act in a society like Ireland. I think we still have quite a long way to go before we accept all our reality, you know, and, and actually have the confidence to say that we can change that reality, you know, we can actually make it better. Fintan, uh, reading this book, you're kind of bumping into history all the time, whether it's John Charles McQuaid all the way up to 2018. Uh, are you kind of like the Irish Forrest Gump in a way? Uh, well, I like to think of myself as the Irish Zelig from that Woody Allen movie, but um, the Forrest Gump analogy, uh, people keep <laughs> keep mentioning it, so I suppose I have to accept that I am the Irish Forrest Gump, yeah. Now, the, the title of the book, We Don't Know Ourselves. Do we need to know ourselves? Well, you in one way, we do. You know, I mean, any mature society needs to be able to accept its own realities, good and bad, you know. And I think for an awful lot of my lifetime, we were too adept at, at deciding not to know certain things that we really did know, of course. You know, we knew all about a lot of the nasty things that were going on. 
But we were just very, very good at pretending that we didn't see them. At the same time, I think there are elements of, of you know, the Irish imagination where actually one of the reasons we're very good at fiction is exactly because we can live in two kinds of worlds at the same time. So I tried to capture both, both of those realities, I suppose. I noticed there's a bit of swearing creeps into your language and your writing over the years. And there's a whole chapter with, it with an F word. I think it's about the crash. Does that speak to your true Dublinness, especially that you're in, in Princeton University, where I'm sure that kind of thing wouldn't be tolerated? It certainly would. Would not. I have to be very careful here. I was talking about living in two worlds at the same time. And of course, uh, I suppose like most Irish people, you know, I have different voices. I have a, I have a nice, respectable voice that people um, often hear. And then um, I, re I remember my kids being absolutely shocked when I took them to a Gaelic football match in Crow Park and hearing this horrible stream of language coming out of me. <laughs> so there's still a bit of a Dublin courier there, you know, which I, I don't quite want to lose. Well, we don't want to lose it either. Thanks a million, Finton. Fenton was the third of our six finalists. After the break, we'll be meeting three more authors. But first, in 2020, we Irish spent a phenomenal 161 million euro on books. We met some people on the streets of Dublin who told us about the books they bought. So a recent book that I have really enjoyed is Exciting Times by Nisha Dolan. It is about a young woman called Ava who moves from Ireland to Hong Kong to kind of find herself in the world. My favorite book recently is World Wide Web by Bella Antonio and I've just been enjoying reading poetry lately. So, just been in that mood. <laughs> and one of the books that I've been reading most recently is called The Dublin Railway Murder by Thomas Morris. It's a historical retelling, an event that happened right here in Dublin 100 years ago, and it's been really great to read as someone who's completely new to Dublin. This isn't something we'd normally be told over in America. One of my favorite books, it's The Long Walk by Stephen King, writing as Richard Bachman. Um, and I think it's just so beautifully written in the sense that I get really um, invested in the characters. Um, and I think because of the type of book it is and the way Stephen King leaves you on edge a bit, you're constantly wondering if something bad is going to happen to them, but you have the hope that it's not. <laughs> on Post. Proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards. On Post. Proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards. Welcome back to the Chess Room in Tully Nally Castle, where we're moving towards end game at the 2021 On Post Irish Book of the Year. The six books in contention for the award are... Your One Wild and Precious Life by Dr Maureen Gaffney. A Hug for You by David King. Ashling and the City by Emer McLysett and Sarah Breen. Did You Hear Mammy Died by Seamus O'Reilly. 
We Don't Know Ourselves by Fintan O'Toole. Beautiful World, Where Are You by Sally Rooney. When friends Emer McLeisett and Sarah Breen first joked around online about Ashling, the rural everywoman, little did they think they were creating a character that readers would fall in love with across four novels. The National Book Token's popular fiction book of the year is Ashling and the City, which sees Ashling leaving Ballygo Brunch and taking on the Big Apple. We went to college together and then we lived together in various apartments and places and just one of the days we were sitting there shooting the breeze we just came up with the character of Ashling. We just grew to love her a lot. She was always kind of like we wish we were more like her. Yeah, like she was aspirational. And I think every single Irish woman has at one point or another had this idea I'm going to go to New York, I'm going to make it in New York. Yeah. And Ashling is no different. <laughs> The Ashling and All of Us girls is dashing to work, we're in our sketchers and we have our court shoes in our Brown Thomas bag. And she moves to New York in the newest book so it changes to a Bloomingdale's bag. And they're always asking her like, what, what do you bring in that bag? And she's like, my shoes, <laughs> obviously. So an Ashling is a hard working country girl who's just trying to do her best in the big cities. When they go out, they just go to the pub, but when they go out, out, they go to the pub and somewhere afterwards and have a night out in the tiles. We'd be there thinking, is she going to go out or out, out? And her friend Magella is always kind of coaxing her to go out, out on a Thursday, which, I mean, that's a school night. She wouldn't want to be doing that, but sometimes she lets go of herself and off she goes. She is hyper organised, so she has everything ready to a T. These are my travel planners. I have to have everything organised and written down here, so I know exactly what I'm doing, like a complete Ashling. And she's just like the loyal, dependable friend who, on a night out, will genuinely keep an eye on the handbags. You know, I think people see themselves in her because Ashling is a person who sweats the small stuff. She's a little bit neurotic. A lot of times in books, we don't get that type of character. So I think that people who relate, you know, they feel seen. I definitely have the Ashling gene. I would definitely see myself as an Ashling because she's like the organiser and the planner for her whole friend group. So Ashling will be the one to make the WhatsApp group and make sure that everyone is reading everything and replying to everything and organising the nights out, just like me. Oh, I think there's a little bit of Ashling in all of us, but I think every character, even the mum putting on the electric blanket for the brother coming home from Australia, I just can't think of anything more typical Irish mammy. The Facebook group is kind of how we got the book deal. Conor Nagel from Guild Books approached us and said, look, we think that this concept, this character could have legs, would you be interested in putting something on paper? And it just seemed like a good idea um, and like the right time for us. Yeah, they did take a chance on us and they were really encouraging and that's how the first book came right. Like one of the things I remember doing was being cross because we have so many mutual friends, like we were trying to count up the people that in our lives who might buy the book and I was like, <laughs> well, they're both our friends, you know, if we had separate friend groups it would be so much easier. <laughs> we thought maybe like 40 people might buy the first one. So it was a huge surprise when it went into reprint like the first week yeah. and then it just kept going and going and it's taken off in ways that we never ever imagined. Yeah. We've never written a book before, either of us. We only know how to write books together and it worked for the first book and we've been doing it ever since. If it ain't broke. <laughs> Emer and Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. So what does it mean to you guys to be nominated for this prestigious award? Um, it feels really special because winning the Irish Book Award in the first place was such a surprise because we've won it twice before. And after we'd won it the first time, we were like, that's it. Like, that's our, our go is done and we've won an Irish Book Award. And now we've won three. And that feels like such a treat in itself. And then to be put forward for this, another award, is just, you kind of forget that that's part of it. Um, so it's extra special, isn't it? And anything that requires members of the public to vote is always so exciting and we're so grateful because everyone knows it's just so painful to go on and vote for people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like, please vote for me. And then people sometimes do actually do it. <laughs> and we hear an Ashling film is in the works. Um, it was originally a film, but it's actually now a TV show. So we have written the pilot, which is very exciting, yeah. and we have done an outline for seven further episodes. So we're just beavering away on it and hoping that it gets picked up. Mm. OK, you both obviously love to laugh at the same things, but what's it like to write comedic fiction? Does one person suggest something and the other person maybe not find it funny? Or how does it work? We do genuinely forget who wrote which bit. And I read a bit, laughed out loud, literally, and wrote long, said, I must tell Sarah that was very funny. And then she was like, you wrote that. 
so you've just lolled to yourself and I was like well I thought it was you so the, me, I meant well <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much guys this is why we hate this being virtual we wish you were here having the crack with us but thank you Emer and thank you Sarah and good luck now don't judge a book by its cover was the old cliche trotted out by many's the teacher trying to get students motivated to read a Shakespeare play or an Austen novel. But how important are cover designs in attracting reader interest? Can a well-designed cover make a good book into a bestseller? We asked a book designer about the art of attracting readers. My name is Emma Byrne. I am the design manager at the O'Brien Press in Dublin and I design the book covers and the inside of the books for the publishing list each year. For over 20 years I've been designing covers. It's the first thing you see with a book. There's so much competition that it needs something to help it stand alone from the others. So in my studio, which is my girl shed, which is out in the back of my garden, I work on all the cover designs out there. So that's where the magic, the tragedy, and all, all the rest of it happens. The process usually starts with me getting the title and the subtitle of the book. I then do some sketches in my notebook. In those sketches, I roughly put in where the typography is gonna go on the cover so I can see how large the author name needs to be or the title. I have a think about colors that I'm going to use. And then I go away and I come up with a whole load of different concepts. It could be five, six, seven concepts. This sketchbook I would normally do, um, yeah, very early day sketches, very rough. Um, very free. Sometimes you just need to um, feel it out as you go. If we decide to work with an artist, I commission them to do a couple of different roughs. I would work with the typography or the lettering that's going to appear on the cover. And then when we have a strong case, we would go to the author and say, this is what we think is going to really work for your book. This is my local library and it's just a fantastic place for me to come to get inspiration, see what other people have done, see what's been done before. The six foot test was the traditional idea of what would help a book stand out in the bookshop, that you can see it from six feet away. One of the really clear winners here is um, Zadie Smith's Swing Time. Just three colours and look how it stands out. Because this book is very sensual, even though they don't use an emboss, it feels like you can touch that, which is very clever. So sans serif here, and then the le this letter is quite uh, different to the rest of the type because it's alluding to history. Oh yes, the Michael Connolly, the name, it, it's a little bit hard to read there, I think, actually. It's, you know, had, had I designed this, I might have done Michael Connolly's name in a different color or, or, or an illuminous thing. For my own taste, there's too much of the same color. Judging it by its cover, you don't want to judge any book by its cover, but it is an important device that sometimes you do. A young boy, Adam, who appeared in last year's Late Late Toy Show, stole the nation's heart with his idea for virtual hugs at a time when so many people couldn't be with their loved ones. Now his dad, David, has written an illustrated book inspired by the response to that TV appearance. We caught up with the two of them to hear all about the Specsavers Children's Book of the Year for junior readers, A Hug For You. A hug has always been an important symbol and a gesture for Adam. During the pandemic, he really, really missed his teacher and he missed his classmates. His mum and himself said, look, let's make a virtual hug for your teacher. So he got a piece of paper, an A4 sheet, and he wrote a hug for you on it, did the hearts, did the scribbles. And they took a picture and they sent it to his teacher. Then, of course, we went to the toy show. It was all Adam-like, and the thing is, like, the, the way Adam was in the toy show is the way he is. All I just said to him before he went on was, look, Adam, enjoy all of this now, it's really special. And I said, don't forget to give Ryan a virtual hug. And sure, the rest is history, as they say. Are you the kindest child on the planet Earth? Did you make it yourself? Yeah. Okay. So where did it go from there? Um, I guess it went to um, space. <laughs> Adam, how are you? It's, uh, my, my name is uh, Commander Chris Hadfield. How are you today? I'm good. People tell us all the time how they were inspired by Adam and inspired by the virtual hug, but I was inspired by them. And I just really felt it was a story that needed to be told. 
The hug keeps growing bigger and brighter as everyone shares it around. Soon it's a hug that wraps around the world and even the astronauts feel it. It's really, really important to us that Adam gets to see himself in the stories that he's reading and the stories that he's seeing and being inspired by. And I suppose we're very grateful that Adam gets to be a role model, don't you? Yeah. What's a role model? It's a person, it's a person that somebody really likes. I kept coming back to two things as sort of my anchor and my compass in writing the story. One of them was what Adam said to Ryan on the toy show, that the virtual hug was for everyone. And the other one was a lady that we met, she said to Adam that you and your virtual hug have been a light in dark times. I also want to be a cat come to look after my brother Danny, because my brother Danny wants to be an astronaut when he's older. If I, if I did that job, then I'd be the first wheelchair cat come. Adam and David, thank you so much for joining us. And Adam, you look really smart in your awards outfit. And I'm going to ask you, first of all, did you help your dad with this book? Well, I helped you because when you wrote, wrote the bits that you wrote so far, then you'd read them to me and I would tell you what, what I liked and what I didn't like, but everything I liked. Well, it was brilliant because all your ideas are fantastic and they made it into the book, which is a good sign. David, where did you get the idea for this book? Well, the idea was twofold, I guess, Oliver. The first one was uh, Adam himself. Uh, I mean, it, it, he was a real inspiration. And then secondly, it was the people themselves and the way they reacted to Adam and his message and how they took his virtual hug. Like, where did we see the virtual hug? We saw it absolutely everywhere, didn't we? Yeah, we saw it on a bridge and it went into space. Into space and all and those places. Loads of places. And on a bridge. It's really the bridge that makes him especially happy. Is there something special happening this Christmas on TV that might feature Adam? It's a Christmas special and it's called Adam Saves Christmas. Well, we've no doubt that you are the man to save Christmas. Listen, thank you both very much. Congratulations on the book, Adam and David. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks a million. Now, psychologist Maureen Gaffney has been the wise counsel to decades of Irish hang-ups, relationship problems and mental health crises through her regular radio slots. Her new book, the RTE Audience Choice winning tome, Your One Wild and Precious Life, is a navigation aid for sailing through life's turning points without running aground. The reason that I call the book Your One Wild and Precious Life is that um, it came actually from a poem by Mary Oliver. I think every word of that little phrase means something. It is your only life, it is your precious life, and, and it's also full of surprise and wildness. Once you hit, it's certainly your mid-twenties, and all the way through until you retire, <laughs> you're in this rush hour of life. And you do pay a price uh, because you miss out on these really precious moments that, that don't come around again. You know the way kids say, you know, I'm not seven, you know, I'm seven and a half. But at midlife, there's a very significant shift. And instead of thinking of all the time that has elapsed since you were born, you're thinking more of the time left. And that's a very significant change. You have one wild and precious life, just one. One opportunity to live that life in your own way. So you want to make that life count. The contours of the life course have changed radically in the last hundred years. In the 21st century, you live your life on a high-speed motorway with multiple lanes, intersections and exits, and with the destination a lot further away. More years were added to the average life expectancy in the 20th century than in all previous millennia combined. If you've already made it to adulthood and are in reasonably good shape, there's a good chance of living into your 90s. And whether you do or not, you must live and plan as if you will. You get happier as, as you get older. And the reason people get happy is because they start intentionally paying more attention 
to the good things in life. With time limited, that you don't waste your time fretting about stuff that isn't important. There's a big temptation to think, you know, been there, done that. Well, you haven't, you know. There's people who are going to come into your life, if you let them now, that are going to give you an entirely new perspective. There's new ways of looking at the most familiar things. It's, it's never over, you know, the story is never over. Maureen, if you go for a pint with someone who you haven't seen in years and they say, you know, oh, you haven't changed a bit, could that possibly be true? I think when people say that, what, what they have in mind is there's something essential about you, something that they associate very strongly with you that is still there. I, I think it's, it's very complex because it speaks to your own sense of your own identity. We are taught from an early age not to mess up, not to make mistakes, but is there value in making mistakes? Well, first of all, there is no life that isn't without mistakes. But it's interesting, you know, when we look back on, the, say, the last couple of months, the things that we regret um, that, that we do are usually something stupid that we did or said that we wished we hadn't. But when you look back over your life in a more long-term way, the biggest regrets uh, are not the things you did that mightn't have worked out. It's the things you could have done that you didn't. You can never judge your life really in a short-term way. Life is always changing. And the big lesson I think I wanted to leave the reader with at the end of the book is be bold, you know, um, go for it. Well, here's to making mistakes. Thank you so much, Maureen. Now, it won't be long until we discover who's won the 2021 on Post Irish Book of the Year Award. That's coming up after the break. Meanwhile, did you know that 87% of us read for pleasure, 70% for knowledge, and 85% for an escape from the humdrum reality? Our reading pleasures are vast and varied, as we found out. My favourite book at the moment is John Connolly's The Nameless Ones, a most wonderful writer, beautiful tone of phrase in his, in his writing, and he draws characters very, very well. Even the minor characters that may only last a couple of pages are very well drawn. You could think they're going to last for ages and then suddenly they're killed off on the next page. The book I'm reading at the moment is Millionaire Success Habits by Dean Graziosi. This book is a great book about an underdog who shouldn't be a multi-millionaire, but he is. And he tells us how we can do it too. I got this book uh, from a 90-year-old man I delivered to and I wanted to know a secret of how he's living so well and he's still driving and still walking away running around and he gave me this book as a gift and it's all about eating whole food plant-based diet and how to stay healthy. My current favourite read is Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin, series of seven. You've seen it probably on the TV but the book is so much better because the characters are so well-rounded and he lets you in exactly what they're thinking. You know what they're thinking and you know where they're going to go but the characters, oh God, they're brilliantly written and you want to follow them. This is a Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia. She's a Mexican Canadian and this is one of her newest books. It's a fiction, historical fiction um, that speaks about Mayan mythology, which is rare to find. On Post, proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards.
on Post. Proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards. In the last two years, doctors have been everywhere. But there's one doctor who never has bad news for anyone. She is the chief medic with Children's Books Ireland, and she can recommend the right course of treatment for any kid who's aching to read a good book. My name is Dr. Ruth, uh, and I am a book doctor with Children's Books Ireland. So welcome to the book clinic, and look at all of the books here. So when you come and visit the book clinic, it's a lot more exciting and a lot more fun than visiting a regular doctor. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you an injection. It's going to be very nice. So based off of what the uh, patient tells me about what books they enjoy and what they dislike, I come up with a list or a prescription and I write it into their book passport. Then you can take your list to the bookshop or to the library and get yourself some new books. Does that sound good? They have such great ideas, like they really know about books. They give you such good recommendations that they think that you'll like, so it's very personal. The book clinics that we run, they run nationwide and they came about because we were receiving so many calls looking for recommendations for the children in their lives. So do you want to tell me what kind of stories you like to read? Well, there's lots of stories that I like. Brilliant. Children have complete ownership over what the conversation is and what direction they want to take it in. And it's all about their interests and their passions and what they might like to read. I like, like, picture you want. Mm -hmm. So lots of illustrations then. Yeah. And is there anything that you don't like reading? Grown-up books. Grown-up books, OK. I won't give you any of those then. Any hobbies you have or anything like that? Well, I play football and athletics. Well, that gives me loads of ideas. We know there's a massive drop off, particularly between seven, eight, nine year olds. And that's usually when you lose a reader. So we need to make sure that they're aware of books and they have access to them. Our vision is to make every child a reader. The waves keep getting bigger and bigger. Another one, hold tight, here it comes. Like if a child is finding it hard to find books to read, then I'd really recommend a book doctor, even if they're not the biggest fan of reading, because just tell them that you're not a huge fan of reading and they'll recommend shorter books for you. It's such a lovely thing to walk out with your own prescription, your name's at the top of the page. It's one for you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> It's been another really busy day at the book clinic. We had as young as three and as old as 13 coming in today to try and find some good reads. It's always worth it at the end of the day when you see a child go away with a really lovely list of books that they're dying to read. I'm at the library writing desk in Tully Nally Castle where present owner, historian Thomas Packenham, penned his four great histories, often using sources drawn from these very shelves. We're here tonight, though, to talk about six books published this year. The contenders for the 2021 On Post Irish Book of the Year are... Your One Wild and Precious Life by Dr Maureen Gaffney. A Hug for You by David King. Ashling and the City by Emer McLeisett and Sarah Breen. Did You Hear Mammy Died by Seamus O'Reilly. We Don't Know Ourselves by Fintan O'Toole. Beautiful World, Where Are You by Sally Rooney. Joining us now, fresh from jury deliberations, is On Post CEO David McRedmond. This is the grand prize. This is the big one. There were a lot of competing genres. You've got a novel against a children's book. You've got psychology versus memoir. How does the jury get through those deliberations when you've got so many different genres? In some ways, it's easier because you're not comparing, say, the literary merits of one novel with another novel or a poem with a poem. You're actually just thinking, what's the impact the book's made? What's the impact it's made on me? What's the impact it's made more generally? is the book of our times um, and really having in many ways a kind of more normal and human discussion as you would amongst friends about books. They are six brilliant books, beloved of course, because there's a huge public vote involved here. Was it a close run thing in the end? You know, I think we have to remember each of the books is already a winner. They all won their prizes and that's really important. So we had great books to choose from. But the winner was actually in everybody's top two favourite books. So that made it a sort of fairly calm discussion. So were there no kind of fisticuffs and rooly when it came down to making the final decision? No, I, I, you know, I was a bit disappointed. I was expecting mayhem <laughs> and uh, it wasn't mayhem. It was actually a, a very mature deliberation. Okay, let's get our authors back. We're going to welcome back Sally, Finton, David and Adam, 
Seamus, Maureen, Sarah and Emer. We're going to go and find out who has won the overall prize. So good luck and Godspeed. And let's hand over to David McRedmond for the big announcement. So the winner of the Unpost Irish Book of the Year, We Don't Know Ourselves by Fintan O'Toole. Ah, congratulations, Fintan. You look surprised. Uh, I'm flabbergasted. Um, slightly embarrassed uh, when I think about all the other brilliant, brilliant authors who are on the shortlist. Um, any one of these books, I think, would have been a fantastic book of the year. Now, you've won an Irish Book Award previously, but this is the overall prize. This one must feel different. Uh, it does, you know. I mean, I suppose for the reasons that, that David was talking about, you know, to have a book that you hope speaks to people outside of a particular category. And I suppose it's trying to recognise something that maybe hits a chord more generally with Irish people, uh, with where Ireland is right now. And also, I suppose, unlike other books I've written in the past, this one is pretty personal. You know, there's quite a lot of me in it. Um, so it feels a bit more vulnerable and therefore you're just a bit more grateful uh, if people like it. Thank you very much, Finton, and thank you to David McRedmond. And indeed, thanks to all our authors for joining us virtually tonight. Uh, they're all, of course, winners as well because they won their categories and so on. But as a crowning achievement for Finton, it's a very, very important book that's bound to endure as a testament to Ireland's modernisation for years and years to come. Well, that's it. That's the Unpost Irish Book of the Year over for another year. But if you're on the lookout for book recommendations beyond our six finalists, you could check out books by the other category winners from the Unpost Irish Book Awards. Good night. The Sunday Independent Newcomer of the Year, Snowflake by Louise Nealon. Eason Sports Book of the Year in association with Ireland AM, Fight or Flight by Keith Earls. The Irish Independent Irish Crime Fiction Book of the Year, 56 Days by Catherine Ryan Howard. The Journal.ie Best Irish Published Book of the Year, The Coastal Atlas of Ireland by Robert Devoy et al. The Book Selling Ireland Cookbook of the Year, Everyday Cook by Donald Skeen. The Book Station Lifestyle Book of the Year, Decor Galore by Laura de Barra. The Love Lauer Gaelga Irish Language Book of the Year, Madame Lazar by Taig Machdonagon. Teen Young Adult Book of the Year, The New Girl by Sinead Moriarty. And the Specsavers Children's Book of the Year Senior, The Summer I Robbed a Bank by David O'Doherty. Unpussed. Proud sponsors of the Irish Book Awards.